So yeah, so this course is then about speciation and actually a bit more about genomics, like speciation very old topic, we'll see, but um, more, yeah, the genomics part is kind of the novelty is the last, uh, sorry, the last years. So um, we try in this course to really like diversify the models of studies. So we go from plants to animals, of course, we'll see that actually like the, um, the concept itself of speciation and species doesn't apply to everything. So. Um, I don't know what you're working with, like, are you working with animals or plants or? Fungi. Fungi, okay. Fungi we'll talk a bit, but it's the same fungi a bit. This in between um, definition of species, so yeah. Otherwise, fish. animals, fish, okay, then. Okay, birds, okay, and then plants. Uh -huh. Okay, cool. So yes, so genomics of speciation and then adaptation. Um, yeah, I was just saying actually like speciation is very, very old question. It's like, and it's kind of very philosophical question in a way is how discrete forms of life, by discrete I mean like we can make them or we can differentiate them just by looking at them, for example. So how discrete form of life just appear to start with and how they remain distinct or discrete. And that's, extremely old. I mean, of course, there is a myth in the Bible of the creation, but actually the creation myth is something which you can find in most civilizations. Here's just an example of like the, the Finnish folklore, where you have that guy, I can't say the name, but that basically where the one sowing all the seeds of all possible plants existing, like from the forest, from swamps, meadow, whatever. So like, yeah, just easy way to explain why there are different entities and why they say like this, just because they were created that way and they just didn't move. And then a bit like a bit later, so like uh, ancient Greeks, like probably know about this spontaneous generation theory. Yeah. So yeah, so it is quite simple. Is you have life arising from non-living matter and in appropriate form in a way, like the most easy form, in depending on the environment. And here, for example, Aristotle thought that from sand you could get scallops, or from the mud of the Nile you could actually get some mice, for example. So yeah, so that has been like a human question and human concern of what is creating species and, and what is maintaining them. And another big question is actually, are species real? Like, do we just, as human, put everything in boxes? Or is this discreteness, is distinctiveness, is it a real thing? It has been a still kind of a debate, but in the 60s actually like people tried to answer these questions by kind of outside of biology. What they did, they thought, okay, if we go to a place where you have indigenous people that has not been in contact with other civilizations, we ask them the names, the vernacular names of species, and we compare that with what we define as species according to the Linnean criteria and to our morphometry. Um, and that way they thought, okay, if there is concordance, it's completely different approaches. If we can still find the same kind of species in both cases, then that probably means that there is something real as discrete species. So that's what I did in this place in New Guinea, um, and it was, it's about birds. Uh, and as a tribesman, okay, how many different species of birds do you know um, in your language? Then they compared that to the um, number of species defined by uh, Linné and just made an overlap between the two. And what was quite striking is that most of the species defined in, by Linné were also having a specific name uh, in the tribes, which suggested that, okay, there is something, there is discreteness in nature. Which, of course, is not always as clear. I mean, of course, there is one species here that was described by linen criteria, but not found in the vernacular terms. And, of course, there is plenty of cases where the boundary between species is pretty blur. And, of course, we can think about Darwin. The thing is, actually, Darwin didn't really answer this specific question whether species are real or are just basically natural variation, continuous variation that we just put into boxes. It was quite ambiguous. I mean, he wrote kind of one thing and the opposite uh, in his uh, written uh, works. And this is one example, for example, or basically for him is just what I'm telling you. He believes that species as itself are not real. And we just put 
into boxes what kind of seems together and not just natural variation that we classify. And then for him, another important thing that's remained up to today is like diversification, what we could call speciation in some cases, is actually mostly a result of either local adaptation or sexual selection. So he had at least this idea of what creates this diversity is driven by some kind of selection. And um, I will come back to this later. And just like more uh, recent history, let's say, um, that just the number of publications with the term speciation um, from the 45, because we don't have data before. And that's um, normalized to the total number of publications. So it's, it's not just reflecting the number of publications over time. And what is quite interesting, there was quite intense debate actually from the modern synthesis time. I guess you heard of some modern synthesis? Yes, more or less. So it was just this effort to try to consult the genetic knowledge at that time with then Darwin um, ideas of natural variation and, um, and natural selection. And so from that time, there was this discussion of genetics and came back the idea of speciation and Mayer, which was one of the main builder of, of what we know about species now, proposed a definition that was debated for, yeah, for almost 20 years, um, which probably matched the fact that there is much more publications about this. The funny thing is, after that, after these hot debates, like speciation was kind of not fashionable anymore. Um, as you can see, like from 60s to 90s, it's kind of dropped. And that coincides at least, maybe it's not causal, but um, coincides with the then discovery of the double helix structure of DNA. And from that, people started to get excited about DNA and actually, as you can see, it's slowly increased. Uh, of course, up to the 90s, it's much higher, but you can see increase in interest there. And the only thing that people, evolutionary people, were interested more was actually how to connect DNA with natural variation itself, not speciation in a way of discrete entities. And we we'll talk a bit about that guy, Selfie Jean. I don't know if you wrote, <laughs> wrote not wrote, but read that book. Um, like in the middle of this DNA uh, frenzy and kind of a revival of speciation soon. You wrote that book, we'll talk a bit about, uh, more um, after that. But then something came, which is PCR in 1984. It took quite some years actually to be usable in the lab. And that coincided pretty well actually with the regain in the interest of speciation. That goes well with the discovery and the use of molecular marker to very extensive uh, use. And molecular marker, as you may know, as are very useful then to infer phylogeny and to infer relationship between species and that was kind of a boom uh, for speciation. And then comes the last factor which is then NGS and genomics which as you can see did not actually influence extremely more the interest for speciation but still it became a great tool actually to answer the questions we've been asking for quite some time now. So that's it and that's where we are and that's where we are in this um, in this context. But now, one thing we first need to answer is actually how do we define a species? And for that, I'm going to put something like this. Uh, uh, okay. So, if you have a phone, you can go to this website. Mm -hmm. Just need to find a way to make this work so you can see. We can look this. Yes, so you can go to this website, menti.com, and put this code. And that will give you the choice between then ABC, which are the three possible definitions of species, and yeah, just for you, what you consider like the most accurate uh, definition of species. You made a choice, everyone? Yeah. So let's see. Haha. -ha. Interesting. So, so no one thinks about the bee. No one likes the bee. Okay. Why not? Okay. Well, at least well, it's kind of balanced between A and C. Um, okay. There is no ecologist be among you or 
maybe not, maybe that's why. Okay, so, so the point of this is not, of course, to tell you what's the best definition, because there is none, and that has been a debate for ages, and there is no answer to this debate. But the thing is more about, okay, so <coughs> in the process of speciation and, and species, what is your interest, actually? Is your interest to, to infer like, the relationship between species for as long as they've been diverging, or are they a monophyletic group or not? That probably the C is going to be your definition. Now, if you want to be, or if you're more interested in what makes species like remain distinct and diverge at the beginning, then the A is probably going to be your definition, which is then focused on the reproductive isolation and hybridization barriers. And the last one is actually more about people interested in like local adaptation and ecology in general, which was basically kind of the definition of Darwin, the closest definition of species that he proposed. So yeah, so to conclude that, the thing is we're going to use the first one mostly uh, because when we're going to look at genomics, we're going to look at what are the genetic elements causing speciation or promoting them, um, including actually local adaptation, but not only, and of course, for phylogeny, I mean, that's, they're going to be a bit, but let's say that we're going to try to combine basically phylogeny with this definition and try to see how hybridization barriers can basically explain the divergence we have between species. So that's how we're going to use phylogeny uh, mostly. So yeah, so that definition was, so one I, I told you actually was then proposed by Ernst Mayer. Uh, that definition, definition changed a bit actually from 42 to actually 95 where it was the last version he proposed. But we're going to use yeah, this one which is then a bit modified by Cohen and Orr which they wrote this book called Speciation. Which is then species are characterized by substantial but not necessarily complete reproductive isolation. In a way that two species are very very rarely actually completely isolated uh, in terms of reproduction. There is always some leaking. It's extremely rare. So that's why a lot of people that oppose the definition were always finding hybrids uh, and saying, okay, so your definition just cannot work. But of course, like biology is rarely black and white. So, um, so that's why it's a bit like attenuated compared to uh, Ernst Mayer uh, speciation um, definition. And then, yeah, so. To choose the definition means we're going to focus more on the processes, on then how, why, when these hybridization barriers occur, and what consequence they have, or potential consequence they have on then maintaining genetic distinctiveness between uh, species. And as I told you, we will include definitely like local adaptation and ecological differentiation as one of these reproductive barriers, um, because there is a lot of research done on it, and yeah, I think it's important that you have an idea of it. Which brings to then the plan of this lecture, which is basically just presenting you briefly kind of all the themes and all the, all the aspects of speciation we'll talk about during the course. And yeah, let's, uh, let's start with these classical uh, types of hybridization barriers. Um, and what I mean by that is there are, there are a multitude of possible hybridization barriers. It's going to see a bit, but there is, there is not an exhaustive list of everything that can like, separate species in terms of reproduction. And of course, what we are interested in the end, like according to the definition, is finding this, finding from a palomictic population, which means you have admixture, like complete admixture, to completely isolated species, what happened in between. And all these little triangles with question marks are which kind of hybridization barriers could be responsible of increasing more and more the reproductive isolation between two species or two lineages that might become or not new species. And this is basically often called the species continuum, which means from, again, it's somehow continuous, like you can have Again, parametric populations, but then some populations that are here, for example, that show some degree of reproductive isolation, but still kind of strong hybridization, up to then, again, like 100% reproductive isolation, as I told you, which is quite rare in the end. So that's, that's what this question or this definition is about. And so there are two ways to 
to characterize the civilization barrier, we can talk about pre-zygotic or post-zygotic. That just means that whatever happens before there is genetic contact between two species or lineages will be pre-zygotic, before there is a zygote that is formed, simply. And post-zygotic means after. I guess that's easy. And as I told you, I mean, I'm not going to make a list of all the possible, just going to give you very b brief examples. And um, one of them then is ecological differentiation. So imagine you have two lineages, let's say plants, for example, that will colonize alpine environment. The alpine population will slowly be adapted to this new environment. And then, of course, it means that they're going to have different traits that will vary, including flowering time, for example. That will be different between the lineages that stayed in the foothill and the one that grow in the alpine uh, location. So that's one of them. In animals, um, we can think, of course, of behavioral uh, differentiation, like everything related to reproduction, sexual selection, like courting, or, or even society, uh, like social animals have kind of rules and which kind of isolate them by default from other animals. So that's one of many examples. This is another example, actually, which is then called pollinator shift. So you have a mutation in the, in the flower uh, color that makes attraction to different pollinators. Like, for example, this is a case that was shown like some years ago, um, where you had a mutation actually from, actually it's the other way around, uh, from, no, it's, it's in that direction, yes. So from the white to the pink, yes? From the Oh, okay. Hello. Hello. Exhibit is done, so I can uh -huh, attend cool. your course. Please, ah, have a seat. Okay. <laughs> so this is one of the examples, uh, and it was co this one was quite nice because they could go down to the gene that caused or the mutation that caused this shift of colors that created the shift in pollinators, and um, and that was a single gene. That was interesting, like one single gene, which means it can be a speciation event, which can be very fast. So that was just one of the examples. Now, uh, if we talk about post barriers, again, there is thousands of kinds, so there is no point in showing all of them. But for example, you have these two species of uh, fish, and then you have a normal embryo on A there, which is then, if you cross, then fishes from the same species. And then the hybrid embryo shows like some weird growth, as you can see there, which leads to the lethality of the embryo. So that's one case. I mean, then you might know this, the liger, which is a cross between a, a, a tiger and a lion, or lion mother and tiger father, and it's actually the biggest cat that we are like, still living nowadays. It's completely artificial, of course, but yeah. And the thing is, of course, it's huge, but it's almost completely sterile. So that's another kind of posigotic barrier. And then in plants, then this famous case of if you cross two species, the hybrid seed itself, the F1 hybrid seed is quite often not viable. So that just, just some examples. And then, so actually this type of barrier has been theoretized quite a long time ago, like in the 30s with the first genetic works um, by these three uh, researchers. And it's, that's why it's called now the bipartisan dubinsky muller uh, compatibility model. And it's, it's quite simple actually. I mean, imagine then that you have like an ancestral lineage, then you start to have differentiation or less gene flow between two lineages that start to evolve separately. You have a mutation, different mutation in each of them. So in one case, in the gene A, you have a mutation that leads to capital A. And in the other lineage, it's actually a mutation in the gene B that leads to uh, capital B. Like, okay, after some generation, this allele gets fixed. And the problem starts when this lineage hybridizes because then capital A and capital B are interactive, interacting like uh, negatively. So there is negative epistasis, which means interaction between genetic loci. That can lead to hybrid lethality or at least hybrid uh, misfitness um, or loss of fitness. So that's pretty simple model that actually works pretty well that are still used even in all these genomic studies that we will discuss are still accepted actually. And then it's quite interesting to consider this because um, the apparition, like, so you can have, as I told you, a multitude of different kind of post barriers, like 
abrilethality, embryolethality, sterility, misfitness, whatever. And the thing is, of course, each of them are probably um, caused by different genetic loci. So you are going to have like arisal or apparition of different mutations that will cause these Dobzhansky molar incompatibilities. And now imagine that you have, as I told you, two lineages that evolve separately. Every, whatever, year or thousand years, something, you have M mutations appearing in each of the two lineages, okay? So one per time. Now, question for you. So, at the time T, so imagine one year or something, why do you think that the total number of mutation pairs, by mutation pairs, I mean, all the possible combination. If you have one mutation in one lineage, another mutation in another lineage, how many combinations of new pair between lineages can you have? And for that, I have another quiz for you. Up. So again, it's time to vote. And this time we can put it actually full. So it can be either, if you have one mutation on each side, then pairs can be just a sum, simply. Or the double, the minus one is just uh, for later, I will explain. So either the ball, the number of mutations at a certain time, or the number of mutations to the power of two, to square. So which one of the three do you think is true? Haha. So everyone who voted, I think. No. Okay, yeah, so indeed the, this one wins and this one is the, the true answer and the reason is quite Quite simple, it's just, so imagine that you have a new mutation arising in each lineage. You have a total of four mutations. Two, because you still have the ancestral one, then a new one, and the ancestral one, and new one into the lineage. And then the combination is just two times two. And if you had three, it would be three times three, so to the power of square. And why this is important? Because actually that's gonna tell you a bit, quite with a simple model, like how fast, like new, Positive barriers arise according, like during time and during differentiation between lineages. And now imagine that finally, okay, among these possible new pairs, you have a probability that some of these pairs are creating these hybrid problems. And then they give you this kind of model, which is extremely simple, but basically, with let's say we have one mutation per unit of time, with 1% of these new pairs being created that are causing hybrid problems. And that's is the number then of total incompatible pairs you can have across time. And as you can see, it's like an exponential curve compared to just like a linear curve, which would be like either addition or like uh, multiplication by two would be the same. So, um, so yeah, so from this model, which is there yeah, from the 90s, it appeared quite quickly that um, it's probably the positive position barriers occur at a very fast pace and in a exponential fashion. The thing is, actually, um, it has been barely demonstrated experimentally. It's, in theory, it's, everything makes sense, but when it was time to demonstrate it like, experimentally, this curve is really fun. I will nevertheless show you an example uh, in Drosophila this time. So you have these three different Drosophila species, then they have different divergence time between each of them. So having these like, three species, you can have, you can look at hybridization barriers, positive ones, and then you can draw a correlation between the divergence time between the three and then the number of uh, hybridization barriers you have. So that's what these authors did. So they just crossed the three different species together. They looked at or phenotype all possible hybrid problems that would be here. Just one example where the hybrid embryo doesn't make it. Um, and then Thanks to genomics, they mapped all the possible genetic combinations that were causing all the possible kind of hybrid problems. So that's a map you have here. I mean, there is no point in looking at it much, but what you can see is that basically there is a lot of uh, loci causing problems a bit everywhere in the genome. So it was a lot of work actually. And then after that, you can just draw this correlation that I showed you before, which is the number of combinations uh, compared to time, divergence time. And, of course, that's what they found, basically, so you, 
that's a linear regression versus exponential one, and this one fits much better um, the data. So the thing is, of course, it's only three points, which, which makes the study a bit like not so reliable in a way, but of course there was so much work in terms of genetics that doing more couple of species would have been yeah, crazy much work. But still, so some people show that, but yeah, as I was saying, it's not, it's rarely found. And maybe one reason why it's rarely found is because in this model, it is assumed that basically you are just, you have mutations appearing and that's it. It doesn't take into account that these new mutations could be selected for or against or completely neutral or the size of the population which will influence the selection uh, efficiency, these kind of things. Which of course will definitely change this curve. And that actually brings to the next point which is, okay, for what we know so far, what creates or what is the cause for abusation barriers? Is it mostly genetic drift or is it selection, which has been a debate also for quite maybe 50 years or something, which is now kind of resolved, let's say. So yeah, so the first idea was to just imagine that genetic drift like creates these civilization barriers. Might it be posigotic or presagotic, it doesn't matter here. Um, and the first thing was, okay, you just have new mutation arising, they're under neutral selection, and just because you have population that are isolated somehow, then you have fixation of this mutation that creates these barriers, and that's it. Or, could also be that you have this founder effect, I don't know if you know what the founder effect is, yeah. the colonization of a new environment, let's say, by a very few number of individuals, and if these individuals carry a mutation that is responsible for an abusive barrier, then they will be immediately isolated from the rest of the, from their congeny or sister lineage. And that's opposed then to natural selection, which then, like, abusive barrier can occur either as a byproduct of selection, I will show you some example, or selection can actually act directly on abusive barriers, and that's reinforcement, I will yeah, talk just about it now. And yeah, so it has been quite a hot debate and then end of 90s, yeah, beginning of 2000, let's say, like very rare case, I mean some cases were fine, where neutral evolution or founder effect were found to be responsible for barriers, but most of the time, like, selection seemed to be the most important drivers of hybridization barriers. So if we think of like byproducts of selection, of course, the obvious case that is known for a long time is sexual selection. So you have two lineages, preference for whatever color in some males in one lineages and preference for another color in another lineages. And of course, after some time, these just don't breed anymore because they have different preferences. Kind of simple. And then the other case is then reinforcement, which the idea is quite interesting and exciting, I would say. So that is like, if you have hybrids that are maladapted, just because, let's say you have two species or lineages like that are adapted to different environments, of course the hybrids in between are not adapted to either or both environments. So they're usually kind of maladapted or they can even be lethal, as I showed you before, or uh, sterile, or these kind of things. Which means that this hybridization is actually very costly for the lineage, or for the individuals at least, because all this effort used for reproduction is actually a waste, because there is no uh, fertile or viable hybrids uh, coming from this. And that's why there was ideas that came that actually there could be positive selection to prevent this hybridization, and all these resources used in reproduction with hybrids, or producing hybrids, could actually be reused for, like, intra-lineage uh, reproduction. And in this case, you would expect that, okay, so if you have, let's say, two species that meet, um, in allopatry, I will discuss like, more what is allopatry, but so like, if species are far from each other, in the population that are far, you shouldn't expect a high level of reproduction barriers. Well, when they are in contact, and that's where abilization could happen, then you would expect a high level of barriers. And I say prezygotic here because if there is engagement and production of a zygote, that's already a waste in um, reproductive uh, resources. 
So of course the idea, what makes most of the sense here is to consider only prosaclic barriers which then will prevent any engagement in uh, reproduction. And again there are actually very few cases, I mean that's very exciting theory, but it's, there are very few experimental cases and one reason is because it's very hard actually to demonstrate that there is really reinforcement. But this case is kind of quite convincing I would say, so you have two uh, species of flocks, so Drummondi and speed data that are both located in allopatry, so in different places, and then they meet. They have this uh, contact zone here. Okay, so here. They have similar colors in flower, uh, which means that basically if they are in contact with this color of flower, pollinators will go from one species to the other. So the funny thing is like where is their meat in contact, when, where is their meat? Um, one of the species actually developed and, uh, a new color, which is dark red. And as you can see here, so basically I just show you the, positive, uh, the relative hybridization rates for this color. So this is one species, this is the other. And as you can see, there is quite a high hybridization rate if they are put together. So they're just here, they're just put together, grow together, and then just see which... Um, what is the rate of hybrid seeds coming from these uh, plants. But then, the interesting thing is like having this dark red actually reduce hybridization. And why, I mean, I won't show you all the details, but I really show that indeed pollinator preference from this one is different compared to those ones. So that's kind of, yeah, I would say kind of a convincing case of um, reinforcement. Okay, uh, do you want a break? No? Okay, cool. Is it clear so far? Too slow, too fast? Good? Okay, cool. So, yes, let's come back to this allopatry, parapatry. I mean, I guess you've probably heard about it, but let's, yeah, that's kind of the basis of yeah, speciation. So, allopatric speciation, very simple. You have at the beginning, like, a palmitic population, let's say, and then you're going to have a geographic isolation. For example, here's the isthmus of Panama, which arose, yeah, 3.5 million years ago. That then make a net separation between these two species that then evolved uh, independently. And of course, it means there is no gene flow between these lineages, which means they will have the possibility to acquire new mutations that could create some hybridization barriers uh, if they would meet again. And again, either as a consequence of uh, natural selection or potentially also a consequence of neutral evolution, why not? Um, so yeah, so that's the idea. So you have separation, they evolve separately, they're probably gonna acquire new mutation that could cause these postzygotic or prezygotic hybridization barriers, and yeah. Allopatric is a bit of the same situation. The idea is again the same, that they're gonna have a reduction in gene flow between two lineages. But that's something else, sorry, I forgot about this. Sorry, so yeah, that's just an example to show you that actually Quite often, allopatric speciation is actually co rarely complete. Like, if allopatric species meet again, it's quite often that there is hybridization and can be quite intense rate of hybridization. Here is just an example of actually so one species, which is Iguana iguana, that you can see is, is widespread over most of South America, versus an endemic species of Antil, and Antil is, I don't know if you say that in English, Antilian species which is endemic, and actually this species is endangered, and besides reduction of habitat and stuff, one problem is hybridization with, with this one, so Iguana Iguana was not found some years ago, like in the Antilles, which are here, now they are found, but they have been introduced by humans. So that's a typical case, and there are thousands of examples now that show that endemic species <laughs> usually or hybridize quite well with reintroduced species that were allopatric before and that suddenly are put back into sympatry. But that also is a case when you have natural contact, it's not only human driven. So yeah, so parapatric. Now, um, so this situation is a bit different, so you're gonna have, in this case, yeah, you have two different environments. One environment which is here not toxic, and another environment which is then full of heavy metals. And then you're going to have adaptation of one of the population that will colonize the heavy metal uh, soil. And this population will get adapted to, uh, to this soil. There is no direct geographical barrier. 
but there is a kind of still geographical barrier in a way, not barrier, but a distance barrier, let's say, that the gene flow cannot be reduced because they're just located separately, even though there is still indirect contact. And the other thing is, the hybrids, if they are, will be maladapted. Again, because if you have hybrids growing in the uh, heavy metal contaminated soils, they probably won't be adapted uh, and will be outcompeted by the lineages that is adapted much better to, um, to heavy metals. So this reduced gene flow um, and this, what is called parapatric speciation, just simply. And then finally, like sympatric speciation is then you have palmictic population and suddenly for some reason you're gonna have isolation between individuals versus others. That's much harder actually to conceive and that's, that's been a problem and actually that's still a current debate. It's keep coming back and, and living in, in the scientific debates. But, um, and why it's kind of debate or why it's kind of a problem? Because the first thing is, of course, if there is constant gene flow between individuals, which should be the case if they are in sympatry, then that's kind of, of course, create a lot of recombinations, which means that if there are any traits such as under selection that could be responsible for reproductive barriers, these traits are just disrupted because of if they are multigenic, let's say, then recombination just give a patchwork of different uh, genes, which then just makes like the rising of hybridization barrier just impossible. And the other thing is, if this happens, then the consequence according to traditional ecology is that basically one of the two species needs to either change its ecological uh, needs or niche, or just one will just outcompete the other species which then don't lead to symmetric speciation, but extinction, or then colonization of new niche. That's the two main problems. But nevertheless, in plants, uh, there is something which is quite uh, widespread, which is called, like, which is poil pruedi. I mean, it happens in few animals, actually, um, in some fishes and some uh, mollusks, which basically you have, for some different reasons, you have a rise of the poly of the poly level, and the problem is then, let's say, from a diploid to a tetraploid in sympatry, if they hybridize, uh, the problem is that the triploid offspring will be uh, sterile mostly, because at meiosis there is problem of just dividing three chromosomes; it's just not possible. So, like the gametes are just inviable. Or even before, actually, like the F1 seeds are very often viable. So that creates an instant um, sympatric speciation event, kind of. So that's one of the few cases which is kind of <coughs> well accepted in terms of sympatric speciation, but overall it remains quite yeah, controversial. And that comes to this, like if you have a situation like this, so this is just two species of crows, uh, where you have both population in allopatry and then contact zone. What is the most probable scenario in this case? That's basically the question we always try to answer is again how species arose, which kind of hybridization barriers, and whether in sympatry first or allopatry and yeah. So for example here, how to know? Um, well, I mean there is no definite answer but there are a few criteria that you can use to, to decide. And one of them is actually the first thing is to consider is by many people, I mean, that many people consider, let's say, is that allopatry is an early hypothesis. Which means that if you cannot prove convincingly that there is sympatry, uh, sympatric speciation, that probably means that, okay, that's, that must be allopatric speciation. Which means in this case, probably they were, they were separated at some point, and this is just a secondary contact zone. Which means they were in allopatry and they meet again. Another way to know is, okay, this species needs to be close sister taxa. If they're already kind of far from each other, then there is very low chance that these two taxa were like emerged together in sympatry. And again, looking at the distribution, like if most of the species is lo are located like in allopatry, then that probably means that what we see as small contact zone is really a secondary contact zone, not the original uh, crowd, let's say, of the, of the species. 
And the last thing that comes, like a tool that comes from population genetics, is to look at the genetic diversity. Because the genetic diversity tells you a lot about the demography and migration events, and where a species arose, usually you expect that the genetic diversity is the highest in the whole range. So in this case, let's say if we find whatever the genetic diversity is of this species is very strong here, and the other is maybe very strong there, that probably means that, okay, it's so definitely arose in allopatry. And if the genetic diversity is relatively low in the contact zone, that definitely means that's a secondary contact zone and not the original place for, um, for these two species to diverge. But that's very case specific. And every time there is this question to ask yourself, okay, what is, what is the scenario, the most probable scenario? Okay, and now, yeah, let's go to the genomics part. So, so that's the most new, I would say, from, from the past years. And again, that's a very great tool, I would say, to determine or to answer this question of how species emerge, what are the processes that create these hybridization barriers. Because we can just do so many things. For example, and that's what you will do in one of the practicals, you can do QTL mapping, which of course is not new, but with the NGS technology, it's made it much more affordable, much more accurate, much more high throughput. So in that way, you can just find what are the so-called speciation genes if you're, if you're lucky. And the way you do that, it's relatively simple. You have these two species that you use as parent for the QTL mapping, and then you're looking for the traits, whatever barrier you're looking at. In the descendancy, either of you can do, go for F2 generation, or you can even do recombinant inbred lines, which means that they have been selfed in case of plants or animals a bit more complicated, but that have been like crossed for several generations. <coughs> and that will be the case we will study in one of the practicals. So there were these two species of Capsilla and the F2 hybrid as look at this, look, look like this. So as you can see, it's not healthy. It has some problems, growth problems compared to the parents. And that has been resolved, and you will work here with this research case in one of the practicals. Then, the other thing is what we can know, and again with this case of uh, crows, is what is the extent of gene flow across the whole genome. Of course, with a molecular marker, it has been possible to do that now for quite some time, but again, with genome, genomic studies, we can now pinpoint where is the gene flow happening. Is it just across the whole genome? Or is it just located in very specific places of, the, of it? And then, of course, you can quantify also much more accurately because with molecular marker, you would have 10, 20, if you were lucky, markers. Now, we can just have the whole genome um, to have a much more accurate uh, evaluation of the gene flow. And then you can tell, okay, depending on that, where are they in this so-called species continuum? Are they completely isolated? Are they not? To which extent? and so on. And then, if there are some regions that are actually reluctant to gene flow, that probably means that these regions may be somehow responsible for some kind of hybridization barriers. Remain to find which kind, of course, and that if you find the genes, if you have good resolution enough, you have some genes that do some function, and then you can infer some hybridization barriers, and then you can phenotype these hybridization barriers. And finally, you can also date the gene flow, which is also not so new, but what you can do is then be able to tell are there some part of genome that are ancient and other pieces of chromosome that are much more recent uh, gene flow. So this kind of thing you can do, and it's the kind of thing you will do in another of the practicals. And to come back then to local adaptation, which is very important for speciation anyway and directly co correlated, it's again, it just, using the same concept as has been used for now for 20, 30 or more uh, years um, of population genetics and expand it to the whole genome, basically. And you can, for example, infer allele frequency for the genome wide, which then again can, with that you can find, okay, are there some alleles that are preferentially found in population adapted to whatever, in this case, alpine versus foothill, and if so, then you have a good indication that this might be the allele that are responsible for local adaptation. Of course, that's not enough, but that's one of the clues you get. So that's, for example, the kind of things you can do. So that just 
called FST screen. So you just, across the genome, you look at the genetic differentiation between populations that are adapted to different environments. We will go in detail with that. And the other thing you can do with, with that is actually, once you find, okay, there is some specific alleles that are fixed in locally adapted populations, are there under some kind of selection? That's what you can do here, just a simple, so uh, the NDS ratio, we will talk about it uh, in the next courses anyway. And then if you combine this data of population genomics with speciation genomics, then it's become very like strong tool because then you can, once you find, if you find speciation genes, you can know how or why they arose. Is it by natural selection? Is it by completely neutral evolution? Genetic drift? Founder effects? So yeah, that's very powerful. And it's also another thing you will test. And yeah, just the last thing on this is, so there is this book called Cephilgin, uh, so you probably know about it, and the, the idea that was kind of not so revolutionary because people were already in this state of mind, but was that the genes are the unit of selection, not individuals like Darwin proposed. And in a way, that's what we are looking when we're doing adaptomics or speciation genomics, we are looking at what are the genes that are, or the allele that are selected in specific population. So we definitely are into this kind of, or this frame of, of thinking. And just, just to tell, like, in case you haven't read that book, I mean, then for Dawkins, we thought that genes were the unit of selection because individuals were just too temporary and too variable to be this unit. And, and yeah, and you had this idea of that we just survive on machines and boxes uh, for genes just to be replicated and, and survive across time. So which leads to one of the points that will be at the end of the course, which is, okay, now if we get out of this gene-oriented view, what's, what is left of uh, the questions about speciation? And one of the teachers, and we talk more about this macroecology and trying to understand another big question is why in some places in the world you have lots of different species while in other places speciation is just very rare and that of course cannot just be explained by genes there must be another reason might be environment might be specific traits of species like of course birds can fly so they probably can colonize more environment which means they can get adapted to very specific environments kind of things so you will have yeah, a lecture on this and now, just about the organization. So these are the different teachers. So it's kind of a mix between then zoology people, uh, plant people. Then Anthony Mahach will be the one teaching about the macroecology. So he's not a genomic guy, but really this more broad view on, on speciation. And then you will have PhD students doing the, um, the practicals. And Rosita will uh, teach you actually on um, more this aspect of phylogeny and how this, how this like really um, correlate or not with hybridization barriers and how you can integrate basically phylogeny, hybridization and uh, hybridization barriers. And yeah, just about the lectures, of course, now we know uh, which day is which. Uh, the lecture will be probably most, I think, all the weeks except the one in May or April, I forgot now, but yeah, you can just check the schedule. And the practicals, and we decided to group them by four, these four check hours or three hours, basically, to have a longer time for each topic, instead of having two every week, which didn't make much sense. So yeah, and the idea was basically to be based on research cases, published results, sometimes unpublished results, and to, there will be a question, like a main question to address, and then you will use what I call digestive bioinformatics, which means you're not going to do the whole process of bioinformatics, but the last steps uh, from the time that there is uh, reads mapping, reads quality control, and so on and so forth. So we just take care of the biological part. And about the exams, yes, yeah, the last thing. So for the theory part, for the lecture part, it will be overall exams. And for the practical, then you will have, depending on how many people join the the practicals to do a report, either alone or together with two people. And they should like answer the question that will be asked during these practicals in a kind of article-like uh, report. So, so yes, that's a plan. And I think, yes, I think that's it.